Sherry. She's, that's two she's made now. And that's impressive. I wish I could do it. Do I have a mic? Did you catch that? Huh? Do I have one now? Can you all hear me? There it is. <clears throat> what a rainy day. I was just out in it. So I went out when we were singing. I had so. So I just want you to know. I, <laughs> and just so you know, Kali and Christine have an animal issue they're dealing with. They're very, I guess they had to take their animal to emergency or something. I don't know all the story. Chris and Christine are in Colorado for Keegan, or um, not Keegan, Kendall. Ke Keegan's another kid I know that's Saul Odell's son. Kendall just graduated. And let's see, who else? Oh, Mike and Kelly, the other guitar player, they're moving today. <laughs> no, they got all their big stuff out. It's all the little stuff. Now, I offered to go help them after church, but they said they didn't need it. Let's see, what else do we have? Charter, I'm impressed you made it. You came in the rain. I think that's cool. Yeah, he brought his boat. What else? I don't think I forgot anybody else that I knew had things going on. So I'm impressed with those of you that braved the rain. It's good stuff. Let's see, ladies night went well? Ladies night. And then what else do I need? Oh, I got to do the offering. I need, I need volunteers for that. Um, What else? Something else I was going to... Hmm. It'll come to me after I get home, probably. Anybody? Anything anybody wants to tell that's unique? Anything happened in your week that was unique? No? Oh, I will. I need to see that. We've got, we, we've got a couple people doing filming. Uh, Damien is doing some filming, and uh, Tim's acting. All right. Yeah, you need to tell everybody or get it here to where they know how to get to your stuff that you want. Okay. All right, I love the sound of rain. Let's pray. We'll get started. Did you get it? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, we, uh, <laughs> we do appreciate the tropical climate we're getting down here in Branson. Um, it is nice to listen to rain, though, and I'm glad everything's green and the flowers are growing along the sides of the road. It's, it's nice to see, so... Uh, Lord, just thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for the fact that uh, you know what you're doing every hour of the day. You're never for loss. You're never confused. You're never not fully focused on your plan. Lord, thank you for our families. Thank you for this church. Thank you so much for forgiveness. Thank you that your desire is for us to know you, for us to experience you. Lord, I, I thank you for the fact that uh, you pour so much of your time into us that if we're willing to listen, you will speak, you will change our hearts, you will change our minds. Lord, I pray that us as people uh, would understand that obedience is blessing. I pray today that you open our hearts and our minds that we can apply what you're going to say to us today. I pray that you give me clarity, that you give me the ability to communicate it well. This was a, a um, hard week, and it makes it difficult to keep my perspective, but I ask that today you just focus me on what you want to say. Those that are not here right now, Lord, I pray that you keep them. 
that you care for them, that they would obey you also, that they would respond correctly to any discipline that's going on in their lives, and that they would see that it is good. We pray for the other churches in our community that are trying to serve you today, Lord. Bless them, give them great uh, skill at proclaiming your word. Amen. Amen. Did you get the hum out? I'm working. <laughs> it keeps trying to hum on me. Hum and a hum and a hum and a. All right. Um, it's a good week when you learn things and when God brings back to light truth. Um, one of the advantages I have in my life is being that I deal with so many other people's lives and I know so many things about all of you. And believe it or not, I know more than what probably some of you think I know. That's just because I'm a spy. But, <laughs> no, um, but as you look at the the waves and the ripples and the needs and the wants and the, the sin um, in my uh, calling it, it can do two things for you you will either uh, properly process it and move in the right direction with it and deal with it correctly and then you have those moments uh, that my father warned me about when he said um, and this is a great illustration he said, there are times in ministry where you'll be looking at a burning building and you see people in all the windows and you're telling them to jump and they won't jump and you have to watch them die. That was what my dad told me. And uh, it's true. Uh, and I'm not the only one that has to deal with this stuff. If you read, um, I didn't give this verse to you, Alan, but you don't have to pull it up. I'll just give it, let you all look it up later. Like Isaiah 6, where God warns Isaiah in advance, they will hear but not hear, they will see and not see, they will, you will proclaim this truth to them, and there are people out there, and in this case, God would say, my people, who will not respond to the message, and just get ready for it, Isaiah. I mean, that's basically what he told him. Same with uh, Jeremiah, God, you know, he was the weeping prophet. When Jeremiah finished his ministry, there weren't a lot of people that were hanging out with him. <laughs> they just, they didn't want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want to hear what Isaiah had to say. Um, that's the hard part of ministry because, believe it or not, if you have actually been called to be a pastor, it, it has nothing to do with you really the spiritual side of it where you actually start loving the people. It, it is a unique thing that occurs. Um, most pastors I know who are actually pastors, not self-proclaimed pastors, but real pastors will tell you the same thing. It is, um, it is a unique thing God does to people that do what I'm doing. And, and honestly and truly, you can believe me when I say this because I do mean it. Um, I really care about all of you. It's really weird, because I used to not like people. I'm just telling you. And now I like you all so much, it makes me want to cry every once in a while. Because I look at all of you, and I know who you are, I know who you could be. I know that God is gracious and good and loving, and that he created you for purposes and for blessing. And I'm starting to spit like a preacher. Um, he has created you for... Uh, the purpose of experiencing him and living out your life according to his plan for you. And I watch, and it would be the same as watching your own kids or your grandkids throw away their talent and their skill and their lives. And it, it's really hard sometimes. And this week I've been dealing with a lot of that. Um, people that have great potential if they would just simply submit and obey God, and they choose not to. Um, I know that you all have people like that in your own lives. Uh, and you want the best for them. I was telling Jim as we were coming in today, I was, my grandson was with us for a few days, and 
he's seven years old. His name's Noah. And I, you know, he always sleeps with me when he comes to stay at our house. We slumber party and try to see how late we can stay up. And uh, I watched him lay there sleeping. And he had in his hand his little Godzilla and this bat type thing. And he's just sleeping with them. I mean, they played with them all day long. And he fell asleep with them in his hands. And I, I was watching him sleep, which is a thrill for me. And I realized that at points in his life, sin is going to be an issue for him. And that there will be people out there that will try and steal his innocence from him. And that someday, he's going to have to live in the real world. And that safety and security that he feels with me will need to be replaced by someone else greater than me. And I know that it has to be God. And I know that there are people in this room that try to find that safety and that security, that ability to be at peace like He was. They, they haven't found God yet. They know of Him. They've heard of Him. They talk about Him. But until you enter into this, this understanding that God really does love you, that everything He does for you, He's doing it for a reason, and it may be that He's using you for someone else that may really need it. All of that has been on my mind this week. And that is not even the sermon yet. It's tying in real well. I sat and tried to write this a number of ways. Uh, at first, it was angry. I was, you know, I'm like everybody else. You get mad at sin. And uh, I called some pastor friends of mine, and they said, no, the people you're talking to aren't the ones that are doing wrong, really. <laughs> so why are you going to ball them out? So what I want to do, and my hope was that some of these people would be here today. They're not. Uh, I want to try and give some clarity to what's really going on in each and every one of our lives and people we know. My hope is, is that God really opens it up and lets you see it. One of my other hopes, and I would say prayers, is that uh, we as a church really start understanding what it means to care about the world. Uh, that's what the sermons were the last two Sundays. We need to care about them and stop hating them. We need to care about them enough to where we are willing to be uncomfortable for their sakes. Too many of us are trying to figure out how to be comfortable. I think that's a mistake. You're, I think it's one of the worst mistakes. I'll give you a classic example. David stayed home when he was supposed to be out on the battlefield and he got comfortable and he ended up messing his whole family up with Bathsheba and her family. It's, there's a mistake that occurs when you stop working for the right reasons. There's, there is a decay that starts to occur. Too many people go to church for the wrong reasons. They are not going, and I know it's hard, believe me. They're not going to serve, they're going to be served. Um, some of the best times of my life, believe it or not, and I was not a good kid. But I loved riding with my dad. He was a circuit preacher and going to all three churches with him every Sunday I could. I was one of his kids that even though I was rebellious, I really loved my father's commitment. It mattered to me. If he would have stopped being committed, I would have been very hurt, even though I rebelled as badly as I did. My rebellion was unique, though, and you, I'll just throw this in. My rebellion was I always wanted men to prove to me that I should follow them. So I would push them. My favorite teachers are the ones that would not take anything from me. I loved those teachers. The ones I despised were the ones I could drive into the ground. And I did. I had one teacher quit crying. She quit. That's how bad I was. <laughs> so there's that level of commitment that we need when it comes to serving God. 
And it is my prayer that this church slowly but surely comes to an understanding of the seriousness of prayer for each other, for the community, for everything that needs to be prayed about that God puts on your heart to pray about. I really hope, and Don and I were talking about it earlier, that we as a people learn how serious prayer is in our lives. Because prayer is one of those things that identifies your understanding of the power of God and not your own. Too many of us focus in on our own abilities, our thoughts, what we think, versus going to God humbly and allowing Him to be the one who establishes your path. I'm going to show you something today that you probably have never read, and if you've read it, you probably forgot it. And um, it helps illustrate what I'm going to try and communicate. So, Alan, give me Second Kings, please. So, this guy, I'm going to call him Rab, but Rab Shekha said to them, has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to, be, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Pretty intense statement, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Let me explain it to you real quick. We'll move, we'll move on to another verse here in a second. You've got Israel being threatened by Assyria. They're coming in to kill him, take him over. And this guy who is threatening Israel is saying to them, these people sitting on the wall, he's talking to leadership, and they usually talked in Aramaic if you were in the political arena. So the Hebrew people sitting on the wall there, the Jewish people, they don't understand what they're talking about. And he's saying, shouldn't I say this so they can understand what I'm saying to you? So he is going to communicate to them that if they follow the leadership of the king of Israel, go to the next verse that I gave you, which is 30, or what is it? Yeah, there it is. So he's saying this to these people. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is the leader of Israel. For thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of, each one of his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine and land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and of honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. So here's what's happened. And this is the genius of God. Yeah, has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his, <laughs> look, delivered his hand out of the hand of the king of Assyria? So here's what I want you to catch. Satan comes along in your lives. Everybody. And he will tell you that what God has to offer you is the equivalent of what this king just, or this leader just said to Israel. You guys are having to suffer eating your own human waste. But I, as the Assyrian, will come in and I'll bless you. And I'll give you what you want and what you need. And I'll make you content. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he says appeal to the Lord. You come with me. And I'll make sure you get the things you want. That's what's going on there. Now that is a direct insult and threat to God. Even though... It's this Assyrian talking to the people of God. But that's what Satan does with us. He tries to convince us continually that what God is offering is awful. And what he's going to offer is what you really want. And what happens in the story, I didn't, did I give you any more? Okay, what happens in the story is they start appealing to God. And they start asking God to intervene. And the Syrians, they lose. The Syrians lose. And Israel wins. Because instead of doing what they were being told to do, which is reject God, they instead went to God 
for assistance, and God delivered them. This applies in every aspect of your life. Every time Satan is messing with you and trying to convince you that God has done you wrong or that what God is offering is not the solution, every time you buy into it and you stop worshiping, you stop coming to church, you start trying to find a place to get comfortable instead of stepping into God's arena, working, all of those things are Satan trying to convince you, listen, go the way I'm telling you to go. You'll have vineyards, you'll have grain, you'll have your own, everything will go right for you if you follow me, is what Satan is doing. The truth of the matter is, when you follow Satan, and those of you who are dealing with this right now, and there are people in this room right now, when you reject and refuse to follow God, you are eating your own garbage. Think about it. i got to calm down. Think about it. Most of the brokenness in your life is you eating and consuming your own junk that you caused to happen, that you produced. Did I do that? Think about that. Very convicting when I started studying the text. I'm looking at it and going, God, you're telling this to me. You're telling me that selfishness, that lying, that cheating on your spouse, that all of these things, and I'm not doing these things, I'm just saying, but all of these things are my waste. God said it, not me. It's there my garbage that I'm consuming. It amazes me how many times I talk to people who are asking for help to change their lives and I tell them how to change their lives and they walk away for a moment in time and go right back to their vomit. Remember the verse? Like a dog I mean, God's being graphic for a reason. They will go back to their mindset, their ideas, their will, their goals, their anger, their hatred. They will go back to all of that stuff to justify what they're doing. And they will not change when God is begging them to change. They won't change. And that's what hurts me the most. Because I watch them die in their sin. I watch people destroy their marriages in their sin. I watch people destroy their relationship with God because they don't have a right relationship with their church. Seriously. And then they wonder why they're so miserable. I don't want that to happen to anybody here. Change is a good thing. There's a point in time in your life where God has made it so clear so many times to you that something needs to change. You have to change. You should be being conformed to be like Christ. If that is not happening, if you're sitting in neutral, if you're going backwards, if you're running from it, you are going the wrong way and doing the wrong thing. You have to be moving in the direction of Christ's likeness. And that requires obedience. It requires a desire for change. Don't miss that. It requires a desire for change. And not change to get even with somebody. And not change to hurt somebody. But change for what is godly and good that brings glory to God. You can talk to me all you want about, oh, praise God, hallelujah, amen, I love God, I love God. But if your actions are to hurt another believer, or your actions are not in obedience to God, you just spewed a bunch of words that have no meaning. Think about it. It's talk. It's talk. You were called to be holy people. You were called to be blessed people. And I'm not talking about money. I am so sick of that money thing. Blessing comes from knowing God. You could be dirt poor and be a blessed person if you know God. It's the truth. Not making it up. 
It's the truth. The problem is, until you cross over to the other side and really believe it, and really start living out your relationship with God, you will never believe that what I just told you is true. You still will think that if you just had a little more money, a better spouse, more things your way, let me say that again, more things your way that things would be better. It is not the truth. More things God's way is better. That's what changes your life. He has to be the one you are pursuing. He has to be the one you're seeking out. He is your blessing. Please get that. Please get that. He is your blessing. We let our bad habits, our pride, that's the other one that kills me. It creates wrong actions and responses. Most of us are confused, stuck. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, I've been married 38 years in July. I grew up in the church. I have seen all the bad things you can see in a church. I've told some of you, not all of you. One of my dad's deacons tried to kill him. Guy went and got all his guns, stacked them up around a tree, got a bunch of hay bales, and called him and asked him to come out to his house. My dad gets there, the guy's wife had called the cops, and there was an ambulance there, and they're hauling him off. He was waiting to shoot my dad. I've seen people spit on my father. I've seen all of the evil that occurs in a church. I've seen it. That is why I think I'm still in the ministry. I think now it's been 13 years. Because that stuff doesn't affect me. Because I don't serve you. I serve God. I'm not here because of you. I am here because He put me here. I love you because He has given me that ability to do that as a pastor. I try everything I can in my life to bend my knee as much as I can to His will because I know that there is blessing in that even though we're having to deal with heartache and pain and sadness. I'm a blessed man, and I can't say that any more clear. And that's not a boast. I'm not a smart person. I'm not a successful person. In my opinion, I'm not. I got you all buffaloed, maybe, but... No, I'm just kidding. But think about it for a minute. God says to you, and He says to me, I don't need that from you. I don't need you to do this. I, I need you to let me do this through you. <clears throat> you want your marriage right? Let me fix it. You want your kids right? Let me Trust me. Let me fix it. You want your church right? Let me fix it. Let me fix it. You guys going to let me fix it? You going to cry out to me and ask me to fix it? Or are you going to try and figure out all your little clever ways to judge the situation, pass your judgment, throw out your opinion, and then do what? You think that spiritual things happen because of your power or because of God's power? You see what I'm saying? I'm blessed because God has beaten me up so bad over the years in the past that finally I got it to where I'm going, wait a minute, this is bad, this is good. Okay, I get it now, Lord. So I want to go this way, right? Not that way because you've got baseball bats over there. I got tired of getting hit. And when I started going in his direction, I just started seeing, he had to correct a bunch of things first, but when he got those things corrected, I started seeing the blessings drop into place. Now I can tell you way back when I had my babies, you know, David, Angel, and Anna, I didn't know that at the age of 55, how absolutely wonderful it is that I had those three babies. And from those three babies, I've got eight grandkids. I had no idea all the way back here that God was going to give me such a blessing now at 55 because I was faithful back there. The problem is, is everybody wants instant gratification. So Satan comes along and he says, okay, I'll give you what you want. 
till you choke on it. Waiting on the Lord really works. Seeking the Lord really works. <clears throat> I don't want to watch families fall apart because both parties or one party refuses to seek God. I don't want to watch that anymore. I don't want to watch people die from the dope anymore. I've had to see too many of that, too much of that. I wish you all could meet, she's probably going to watch this. I wish you all could meet Julia. She's just a beautiful little girl. And her, her daddy took his life. And if you met Julia, you'd see what I'm talking about. She's lovely. Great little girl. Now, they're not going to stop unless you all start taking serious your ministry. Things are not going to stop breaking around you if you, don't, I mean, if you don't get serious about your ministry. This is not about coming to church on Sunday and letting Dan get up here and try and throw you a real good you know, sermon. This is about you actually responding to God, your Father, in obedience. And it starts with praying, and it stop, starts with having a heart for the people that God has put around you. All of them, even if they're wrong. You still love on them. You still pray for them. That's what this is about. And when you start thinking that way in your own personal lives and as a church, you will see change. It may not be tomorrow. So stop thinking, well, we did this and nothing happened. You can't do that. Twelve guys. And Christianity is all over the planet now. Twelve guys. And they weren't educated. Well, a couple of them. Mostly fishermen. But they went and started doing what they were supposed to do. One of the sad things that happens in a church is everybody waits for everybody else to do it. You can't do that. You know, when's the last time I had a vacation? I don't need one. But think about it. I'm 24-7, but you know I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. There's nothing more gratifying than letting God suck all of your energy out of you to drive you all the way to where finally he says, all right, take a break. And usually what happens, those that I know that love the work of God, they're like, no, I really don't want to. I am actually want to, let's just keep going. You need to be like that. You need to have that heart. It's where it's at. And guess what? Ten years from now, 20 years from now, three days from now, you'll start seeing the hand of God working in your life if you stay faithful to it. Let me give you some more, and I'll shut up. <laughs> Go to Isaiah 40 for me, please, Alan. Comfort, comfort, my people, Says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now let me just tell you what he's saying here. I think it was Wearsby, and I just thought of it. Um, he said the word comfort is um, in the Hebrew, it has a variation of it that means repentance. Now, I haven't looked at it. I just thought of it, but I was going to, because I thought of repentance. But it is true that when you are a repentant person, God is able to comfort you. He wants to comfort you. As a matter of fact, He wants to cuff, comfort you excessively, more than what you would think. But you're not going to feel the comfort of God or the peace of God if you are deliberately choosing to disobey Him. You cannot. Now I want you to think about that because I know I, I hear it all the time. People telling me they're tired, telling me that they're, they're sad, that this isn't working and this isn't working and this isn't working. And my first thought is, are you obeying? 
because usually people are not comfortable with God because they do not have a relationship with him that is healthy. Now, those of you that are at that point right now, don't block what I said simply because you don't want to hear it, because it's true. Because I get a lot of that. I get a lot of people, when I tell them the truth, they go pushing it away because they don't want to hear it. Yet, that truth I just gave you is life. It will free you. It will let you go. Too many people resist God when he rebukes them. Step into it. Because his motive is love. Now tell me that's not hard to do. You don't like having someone tell you you're wrong. You don't like it. But I'm not the one telling you. So I suggest you wisely listen to God when he says to you, you're wrong. Makes sense, doesn't it? Boy, it's hard to do, isn't it? (laughs) Your comfort comes from repentance. Now, that doesn't mean you walk around going, oh, please, God, forgive me all the time. There's a difference between asking God to forgive you and actually living your life in a state of, I need your forgiveness, Lord, even if I can't think of anything I've done wrong. You have a mindset of his grace and his mercy on you. You have a mindset that he is forgiving you daily. It's a repentant heart, meaning you are humble before him. You are not proud before him. You accept the fact that you can't even catalog how many times you sin in a day, and you can't but you are humble enough to be repentant in your heart. That means you're willing to let God speak to you in correction, love on you when he needs to love on you, how he needs to love on you, and you are submitting yourself to that. That is a repentant person. I I wanted to show that video a bunch of times, never did it. Where, uh, was it, Raiders of the Lost Ark? What was that one? He said, only the repentant, only the penitent man can pass. And remember those saw blades going through that tunnel? And he kneels. And when he knelt, he didn't get his head cut off. It's a great illustration. (laughs) Because repentance literally will save you from getting your head cut off. Think about it. You know? There's a number of scenes in there. Take me to the next one, Alan. Please. Behold. Now, remember I mentioned change to you. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they sprang forth, before they sprang forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fill it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Did I give you more? Or is that the short? That's it. So look at the the change. You know what's happened in Israel, right? You know that they got really brutalized for their sin. And now God is coming back to them and he's, he's telling them, I want to comfort you. I want to restore you. I want change to occur for you. I want to bless you. That's what all's going on here. Give me the other one, please. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beast will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. The people who I formed for myself, Remember me telling you why you were created and what your purpose is? I created and formed for myself that they might declare my praise. Yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. That's your God talking, by the way. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not brought me sweet cane with money, bought me sweet cane with money, or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. 
You have wearied me with your iniquities. Don't leave that. Sorry. Do you not, let me help you see what he's saying to you. I'm not interested in what you do. I'm interested in how you respond to me. And my weariness as God is the fact that you keep sinning. When I'm the guy that's offered you life, I'm the one that's offered to give you cisterns of water, wine, uh, grape fields, like he said all the way back in 2 Kings. I've offered to take care of you and keep you, and I have not even caused you to strain to bring me offerings. I've given you the ability to not be under that pressure, but simply... Simply step into my comfort. Let me save you. And I'm not talking about salvation from hell. But anything that is contrary to God is death. Anything in your life that is contrary to God is death. And it's like it said in 2 Kings. You were eating dung and drinking urine. It's death. That's why God says don't do it. Don't do it. Let me be the one to bless you, he says. Very convicting, and if it's not, you've got a serious problem. Because you should be convicted by this. Everybody in here. Because God is talking to us. And he talks to us this way because he knows how easy it is for us to go from walking according to his plan into sinning against him and destroying our lives. Hence David in the Bible. It is so easy to start going down a road that eventually destroys you. I know a man who lost his oldest daughter to drugs because he did drugs, and he will not accept the rebuke of God. He will not repent. He just blames her and tells everybody, I don't know why she did this. We didn't raise her this way. Really? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. God should inundate your family life. It should be a conversation that's almost daily in your homes. Really? Really? You meet my grandkids, ask them about God. You meet my kids, ask them about God. They know. All the way down to the youngest, they know. Claire got baptized today. She's up there in St. Louis. They know she's eight. Why do they know? Not because I'm a great guy. But I figured out early on after I destroyed my family that God gave back to me. Don't miss that. He really did save my marriage. Really did. My wife should have shot me. So should have a number of other people though. But... He gave them back to me, and from that point on, God demonstrated to me how to be a man in the lives of my family. Am I perfect? No. But ask anyone in my family, does my dad love God? And they will say yes. That's what I told my father. My dad feels guilty about some decisions he's made, but think about it. I know the Lord because of my father. Because of his faithfulness. Do not miss that. My wife and I have a good marriage. Not because I'm a great guy and she's a great person. Even though she is. I'm, I'm the bad one. As you noticed. <laughs> Since I joke. You don't know. But here's the cool thing. The reason why Susan and I have a relationship like we do. She knows I love God, and I know that she loves God. And she knows I'm serious about it, and I know she's serious about it. So much so that she would let me go for him any time of the week. You could ask her in a drop of a hat, she'd say it. I would say the same. Even though I love her more deeply than anyone on this planet. Because I understand that the power of my life has to come from my relationship to God. It is the source of your strength. It really is. Okay. 
what else do I have, Alan? And I'll wrap up. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Thank you. Thank you. It's true, and that's your God. Isn't that great? Put me in remembrance. Remember me, he's saying. Let us argue together. That's debate. Let's, let's fight it out. Let's, let's go to task on this. You know how many arguments I've had with God way back? Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Some of you are in the process of fighting God right now in your life. Good. At least you're acknowledging that he's there and that something needs to be discussed. It's when you stop that you got a problem. It's when you run away that you got a problem. It's when you refuse to consider truth that you have a problem. But when he has you in a point where you're sweating it out and you're going, wow, I really have gone downhill. I really have lost sight of what matters. When he's got you in that situation and you're thinking that way, you're at a good spot. But if you let your pride, your judgmental spirit, your selfishness dominate your thought life and the way you deal with situations... You were not making any headway at all. You were going backwards, and it will consume you. It will consume you. Y'all, y'all beat up. I don't know where we are time wise. Was like, oh, I got time. Thing is, it's been so deep. I want to give you an example of something, and then we'll wrap up. This was a great example. I wish I would have come up with it. Some of the reasons why you're stuck has to do with people that have hurt you in your life, things that have happened that were traumatic, your father, your mother, teachers, pastors, whoever, your spouses. This illustration this pastor gave was that he knew of a family that had a foster child that was this girl, and they would go to Disneyland and leave her at home. So she ended up getting adopted finally, and the man, the family, and the father was the key issue here. He knew that that had happened to her. So he made the decision to take his whole family with her after he adopted her to Disneyland. She started rebelling and fighting, being obnoxious, just trouble. The whole way there, she was just being bad. They get to their room, she's still being bad. He sits down with her to talk to her, and she said to him immediately, so I'm not going to get to go to Disneyland, right? Now, I'm going to show you this is a brilliant illustration. The father said to her, no. I'm still taking you to Disneyland. And she got to go to Disneyland, and they came back, and he said, what did you think? And she said, I had a wonderful time. Most of us don't believe God's promises, and he promises us blessing. And we kick and scream and fight him and sin against him when he is trying to take us to blessing. Do you see it now? Do you see it? And he's already told you, I'm taking you to blessing. I'm going to bring you here. You're going to be with me. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be great. So stop fighting me while we're going there. Start accepting my love for you. Start accepting that I am taking you in your life to that point where you finally will experience me in my fullness and the joy of your salvation. Do you see it? Great illustration. Great pastor illustration. I stole it from it. They stole from me. No. Don't miss it, guys. Don't miss it. Stop, stop, stop. 
living your life in debt. Start living your life in the joy of your salvation, recognizing that your God is a good God and his intention for you is to understand and know him. Don't make him have to keep dragging you down the road of life. It's a waste of your time, especially if he loves you. Repentance is blessing and repentance will bring comfort. Last verse, I think I gave it to you, Alan, it's Ephesians 1.5. He predestined us for adoption. You were adopted through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. If you were a Christian, you were adopted according to the purpose of his will. His will, you better find it. You better start saying no to your will and start saying yes to His. You better start telling your wrong opinions, your ungodly opinions to go away and stop thinking them and start thinking what God thinks and says and teaches and believes. Get in that habit. Stop just going, oh well, Dan, great sermon. I'm going home now and I'm going to go back to my own garbage and continue to live in my garbage. You want change? Make change happen. Make it happen by being obedient. That's a good ending point. Let's pray ourselves out. Lord, I do appreciate the fact that uh, you're willing to get right up in our faces I appreciate it in my life. You, you have saved me from so many catastrophes. You have fixed so many things I have broken. You have established my path when I have done nothing but take it the wrong direction. Lord, I am very grateful for the fact that I am a blessed man. I am grateful that you have so much affection that you're willing to go as far as you have to to get me to the destination. Lord, I ask that everyone in this room, if they have not experienced that, if they do not know that experience, Lord, with your power, your ability, do whatever you need to do in their lives to bring them to the point of truth and understanding and obedience. Those that aren't even here today that needed to hear this, Lord, I pray that you just work them over till they surrender and submit because it brings comfort and peace and they will have the life that they really desire. As always, we pray for the lost in this community. We pray that, God, you would raise up leaders in this church that can serve and help. I trust your wisdom in this. I pray that we become people of prayer, people of obedience, people who live lives worth living according to your will. Amen.